Uh, the first snapshot was from our reading today, which Jed read. Uh, and we begin with, a, with just a little picture on a, on, a, on a small hill overlooking a valley. And in the valley there's a battle going on. And there's a sunset in the background and silhouetted against that sunset we've got three men. And the one in the middle, standing there with arms out wide. And either side you've got somebody lifting up one hand and somebody lifting up the other and he sat on the rock there. And as we enter into the, the, the action, uh, we watch the battle down below. And we see that whenever Moses' his hands were sagging, the, the battle would go the uh, Amalekites' way. And whenever Moses' his hands were lifted up, the battle would go the Israelites' way. At the end of this battle, after Israel prevailed, in verse 18, so this is Exodus 17, 18, the Lord says something very interesting to Moses. Exodus 17, 18. Yes, it's not 16. Oh, 16, 18. Sorry. 17, 18, 17, 16. Well, thank you very much for that. I've got the wrong number there. It's a right this on a scroll. Uh, 14. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'll do all the shaking heads there. Exodus 17, 14. Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure Joshua hears because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So it's quite an unusual scene this is. A battle going on and the battle is being won when the hands are outstretched and lifted up. But after the battle, then God impresses on Moses to make a record of this, write it down. And above all, that interesting phrase, tell Joshua, that Joshua should know about this. And you think, why that? Why is God himself making this link to Joshua, that Joshua should know? Well, as we spring forwards several centuries, we have the same image. This time it is Jesus on the cross, his arms open wide. Again there is a man on his left and a man on his right. Again he is lifting up and as long as his hands are there, as long as he is on the cross, the enemy is being defeated. And he continues that way until the end of the day. And God is saying, Make sure Jesus, because Jesus and Joshua is the same name. Jesus is the Greek name, Joshua is the Hebrew name. Make sure Jesus remembers this. That when that day comes, when Jesus is there on the cross, that he himself will remember and will be encouraged. This day, there will be the victory over the enemies of God. And we see there another parallel again and again. There are, there are pictures in the Old Testament pointing to the cross. We looked a few weeks ago, didn't we, have a similar image with Samson. Samson pushing against the temple um, pillars, one on the left, one on the right. And he brought down the entire house of the pagans and the pagan gods. Again, pointing forwards to Jesus Christ, hands on the cross, arms out wide, defeating enemies. Last week, we looked at the picture of, um, well not last week, actually a few weeks ago, we looked at the picture of Joseph. And Joseph, when he has the, uh, the, the baker and the, and the uh, uh, cup bearer in, in the prison, they have that dream. And that dream again points to the cross, doesn't it? Because in the dream there is mentioned the bread and the wine. In the dream, there is the three days. In the dream, there is the one who is going to be uh, um, uh, hanging on the wood. In the dream, there was a man hanging on the tree. But all these things are pointing to Jesus Christ. And last week, we had the picture of Absalom. Absalom hanging in the tree, caught by his hair. Pierced three times in his body. Again, pointing towards the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the point is this with all these different images, that the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just something God thought up halfway through, 
that, oh, well, everything else hasn't worked. I've sent them approved profits, but they've not listened to them. No, right from the very beginning, right from the beginning of time, God was planning his salvation through Jesus Christ. And again and again and again in the Old Testament, you have picture after picture after picture pointing to Jesus, pointing to the cross. And there must be an hallelujah at that point of what God has done through him. We move on to another scene. Over into Exodus chapter 24, the second scene. And this time we're all on Mount Sinai. And this time um, God has given the uh, Israelites the Ten Commandments, read them out to them as we have them here read this morning. And after giving the Ten Commandments, what do the Israelites boldly say? All these things we will do. Such, such absolute confidence there. Um, and anyone who's tried to keep all the Ten Commandments, or in fact all the uh, 600 I will surely know, that is not such an easy thing to do. But anyway, the people, they all say, we will do these things. And then, um, if, if you look then, uh, reading then from verse 4, uh, Moses wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent Israelite young men, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls of fellowship offerings to the Lord. So a big sacrifice is being made. Moses then takes half the blood, puts it in bowls, half of it is splashed on the altar, and then he took the Book of the Covenant, like the Book of the Covenant, yeah, and he reads it out to the people. And then the people, they respond, don't they? We'll do everything the Lord has said. And Moses then, he takes some of the blood and he sprinkles it on the people. Imagine him doing that. Imagine you're in a crowd and you sprinkle with some of the blood. And he says, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with this, these words. Now, once a month we do Holy Communion. We have the bread and the wine, and we do it in this, uh, um, our little setting here with a little table and everything. But you remember during that communion service, in our mind's eye we picture Jesus with the disciples in the upper room, and after they've had the meal, then after supper we read that Jesus takes the cup, doesn't he? And then we have those words. Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Now I'm sure at that point the disciples were thinking, what's he saying? That's not in the script. That's not what we usually say. But what Jesus is doing is taking the words of Moses when Moses had said, this is the blood of the covenant, and Jesus then takes the cup and he says, this is my blood of the covenant. That's an incredibly bold thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. To actually take all that that was represented in the Old Testament covenant and say it is now represented here in my blood. So Jesus and Moses are both responsible for giving a covenant. Now the old covenant is, is, is a covenant of works. What that means is you do it and you will live. Yeah? You will obey this, 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 and you will live. The new covenant is a covenant based on faith. We believe in what Jesus Christ has done. That he has fulfilled the testament. He has fulfilled the and we enter into the covenant that he has made. And it's interesting that in, in the um, New Testament, you have that in the setting of a meal, don't you? Yeah, Jesus and his disciples having a meal. And in the Old Testament as well, after Moses has done that covenant uh, with the people of God, after he sprinkled them with the 
blood, after he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, he then gets invited up to the top of the mountain to meet with God. Let's just read for, uh, that, because that's quite a, um, a, an incredible thing. It says, Moses set out with Joshua, his assistant, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you. That's the same Aaron and Hur who were holding up the hands of, of Moses previously. Yeah? Until we come back to you. Uh, and they'll get involved in any dispute uh, while we're gone. So verse 15, it says, When Moses went upon the mountain, a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And for six days it covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. And to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. So it's like they're standing, looking up, and it just looked look like a volcano to them, or something like that. And Moses entered the mountain, so went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. An incredible time Moses then spends with God. But the point is this, you notice that you have a covenant after the covenant, there is fellowship with God. That's a very important thing to remember. We see that again and again throughout the Bible. First comes the covenant, the agreement, then the fellowship with God. You see this, for instance, when Abimelech and Isaac have a covenant, and they have a meal together, they have fellowship. And here, uh, notice in verse 11, uh, this is a... Um, uh, the, the picture where you've got Moses, Aaron, and uh, um, Abi, who bear 70 elders of Israel, on the top of the mountain, they saw the God of Israel. They're having fellowship with God after the covenant was made. Under God's feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, so like a blue crystal. Some translations have said it's like sapphire, that uh, the blue paving stones, bright blue as the sky. But God didn't raise his hands against the leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, they ate and they drank. You see, usually it was expected that if you see God, you would die. It's just that, uh, a, a, a spirit-shattering experience. But they entered into this covenant, a blood covenant, and based on the covenant, they then had fellowship with God. It's an equal an unequal covenant. And what I mean by this is um, covenants, we tend to think of covenant to two equal pairs because we think of a covenant of marriage. Yeah. But many times in the Old Testament, the covenant is of unequal people or unequal entities. And in fact, when the Greeks translated the Old Testament, they used a specific word for covenant, which is throughout the Old Testament, which is only used for unequal parties. They had another word if it was two the same. Because the thing is this, you've got God who is almighty, all-powerful, created the heavens and earth, and he is entering into a covenant with you. With you who are but dust, an unequal partnership. But as they take the covenant together, and as they enter their, their covenant meal together, they are one, they're in unity. It's like when, when a king invites a pauper, come into my palace. And the king does a deal with the pauper and says, okay, you serve me and I'll take you everything. But it's unequal. The pauper can never offer anything really of any value to the king. And so is that covenant between us and, 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 and God. Um, I heard an illustration a few weeks, and the person who gave it said, Pastors, tell this to, a, to your congregation. So I've got his permission. Uh, this guy, uh, Calvin Crombie, um, he used to live in Israel, and uh, he rented a flat in Jerusalem. And he was then a tenant, and once a month he said he would go and visit the landlord and, and pay him money for the rent. And he says, but it wasn't done like it is in England, or Australia, he was Australian. Well, he just said, okay, here's the money, he signs the receipt, and off you go. He said, oh no, this was the covenant in a Jewish context in Jerusalem. 
And he would say, come in, and how are you, and how's the family, and how are you doing? And then they would get a meal out. And they would sit down in front of a large bowl of rice with all, all bits of her meat in there. And they would eat the meal together. And in that context, the landlord and the tenant met. The covenant met over a meal. Because that's how it was done in the ancient world. And there was that definite link between covenant and fellowship. But he noted an interesting point. He said that throughout that meal, even though we were equal in one sense, that we were both eating the same meat and both eating the same rice, in the other sense, I still remained the tenant and he still remained the landlord. And that's the same with our covenant with God. We're entering into that covenant with our Lord Jesus Christ. And in one sense, we're sort of equal, because we're around the same table, sharing the food. But in the other sense, he still remains God. And we still remain mere humans. And let's go to the third picture of Moses, so Exodus 32. So you remember then, when Moses goes off up to the mountain, how many days was he up there? 40 days, 40 is a time of testing. So he's up the mountain, and what did he say before he went, before he went off up there? Wait. Yeah? Wait for me. We're going up the mountain, you wait for me. Exodus 33, 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Sorry? That's we can make a, you know, they make a, uh, their own God. Yes, that's right, that's right, very good. And they said to Aaron, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses fellow who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And then if you've seen various films, you know what then happens. They take off their rings and their earrings and they melt them down and they make this, make this golden car. And they start to worship it. And God's up the mountain with Moses, and God sees this, and God gets angry because they've not been away 40 days, and they're doing this, and they're dancing and reveling. It's an ordinary situation that can happen, isn't it? We're so impatient as humans. But when something doesn't happen in the speed that we want, we can so often forget, can't we? We can so often forget that what God has said. And they make a false God. And they start to worship a false God. And that is so easy for us as humans to do. That, 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 that time of waiting, it reveals who you really are. Are you prepared to wait patiently? For the Lord's timing. Someone else has ascended. Someone else has said, Wait for me until I return. Mm -hmm. Are we prepared to wait and be faithful? to the Lord Jesus, waiting for his return? Or are we going to make some false gods and worship them instead? So anyway, um, Moses is on the mountain and, and God tells him uh, that the Israelites are sinning and the Lord says to Moses in verse 9, um, they are a stiff-necked people. Leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and then I shall make you a great nation. So, God's offering Moses, yeah, I'll destroy all the Israelites and I'll start again with you. What's Moses' attitude at this point? Moses starts to pray, isn't he? He starts to pray and he, he, he says some interesting trust, trust, words. He said, Why should your anger burn against your people who you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil and trend that he brought them out to kill them? 
Yeah? He, he's wrestling with God, he's arguing with God, he's saying, look, you, God, your reputation is on the line here. And he's pleading with God. You know, if your people get wiped out, it's going to look bad for you, God. That's what he's saying, isn't it? But anyway, he goes down the mountain uh, and, and they see all the golden calf and everything and he tells them all off and tells Aaron off in particular. But then in verse 30, you go back up to the mountain again. It says the next day, the next day, Moses said to the people, you've committed this great sin, but I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And Moses goes back to the Lord and he says, Oh, what a great sin this people have committed. They've made gods for themselves out of gold. Listen to this. Because I think this is probably the clearest expression of how Moses is a picture of Jesus. The heart of Moses. He then said, But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The people have sinned. The people have made a false god. The people are all reveling around now. And Moses goes back to God and pleads with God, forgive them their sin, but if not, then blot me out of your book. Yeah. Isn't that the picture again of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Dear Lord God, take me instead of them. We have the same picture with Absalom and David last week. The David at the death of his son, he cries out, Oh my son, oh my son, Absalom, and only I have died for thee. Again and again in the Old Testament. We see the love of God, the love of God, that God wants to take your place, wants to die for your sin, so that you can enter into fellowship with him, so that you can have a relationship with God and sit down for that meal with him. So let's just uh, summarise. From cover to cover, the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now consider this, we mentioned a couple of months ago, the Bible was written in three languages. It's written over a period of about 1,500 years. It was written by many different authors. It was written in three different continents. It is not the musings of one person who just had a little split of something and wrote it all down. We see again and again and again a coherent book the whole Bible points towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Many women are barren and have children miraculously, pointing towards Jesus' birth. Abraham and Isaac, they give us a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus. We had Absalom hanging on the tree. We had David showing his love for Absalom. We have Samson bringing down the house of the enemy. We have Moses with his arms outstretched like this and bringing upon the defeat of the enemy. We have Moses entering the covenant. We have Moses saying, blot me out if you're not going to forgive their sin. We looked at Joseph and the brothers. This is going towards the resurrection. How Joseph stands in front of ten brothers. Then he stands up in front of 11 brothers and he says, look, it's really me and if you don't believe me, come up and come closer and see. Again, that points to Jesus who first stood in front of 10 brothers and then stood in front of 11 and said, I am here, I'm not a ghost, come and touch me. Again and again and it goes on. We haven't had time to look at Daniel who, like Jesus, prophesied what's going to happen in the future. We've not had time to look at the Queen of Sheba who came to visit Solomon, who is a picture of Jesus Christ. Again and again, the Bible from page to page is about Jesus. So what are we going to do about this? If God is so much for us, 
But century after century after century, his plan has been working out. If he loves us that much, who should be against us? But finally, the writer to the book of Hebrews says this, how can we neglect such a great salvation? How can we neglect such a great salvation? And perhaps when we step back and we see the entire picture of the Bible, and see everything that the Lord Jesus has done. In example after example after example of all the Old Testament people. And we see the fulfillment in Jesus. And we realise the truth of the word of God. But perhaps we should ask ourselves again. How can I neglect such a great salvation? So go about your daily business. Keep the faith. Keep the faith burning in you. Keep it strong. Be continually filled with the Spirit. And the end of all things is near. So be ready. He's coming back. Amen. Amen.